Hello and welcome to the next in our COVID-19 discussion series. Um, today I want to talk to you about AP1, uh, the core values and ethos of the Royal Air Force. However, I want to follow on from uh, leadership theory um, in our last video and then relate that to uh, the core values of the Air Force and try and bring the two together. Um, because as we saw last week, a lot of the modern leadership theories are values based. So there is a, a direct link there, things like authentic leadership, servant leadership, things like this. You have to have a knowledge of uh, values. So let's have a look at the core values of the Royal Air Force. Um, before we do, though, I identified three fundamental themes which I saw as running through leadership theory. Uh, these were uh, the ability to communicate, emotional intelligence and courage. Try bear those three things in mind um, because throughout uh, this 50 minute video um, they will be relevant and we're trying to relate those sort of core themes to the core values that I'm going to talk about. You're all really good whenever I ask you on a town night uh, what our core values are. You, all of you chirp up with RISE. Most of you even know what that acronym stands for. Uh, respect, integrity, service, excellence. But what I want to do today is I want to go beyond uh, the words. Okay, we all we all can remember neat little acronyms like RISE. What does it actually mean? And most importantly, how does that affect the day to day we do business? How does that neat little acronym actually affect that you are going to function as a leader and you're going to practice your leadership with us on leadership camps? How is that going to change the way you do business? And that's what I want to get into today. The first video um, is going to be hopefully 15 minutes. This is already take two, by the way. Um, hopefully 15 minutes where I'm going to look at respect and integrity. Then there'll be a second video where we're going to look at service and excellence. Okay. Cracking on. Respect. Like I said, I want to get beyond the word. I especially want to get beyond inspiring cat posters. We've all seen them. We've all seen these posters in gyms or in offices that we've worked in, uh, often with a very nice arty uh, picture up there um, with a quote from a philosopher or an eminent leader. Often these quotes weren't even from that leader. Uh, they've just been made up. Uh, most of the quotes you'll find about that Einstein supposedly said on Google, he never said. Uh, I don't want to be a cat poster. Let's get a meaningful discussion out of this, OK, and um, go beyond that. Respect, I know most of you already got a good handle on, um, the very fact that you are a member of a uniformed cadet service and you know how to pay compliments by saluting, you've been to um, our formal functions, you have a good handle on respect already. AP1 breaks respect down uh, into two areas, those of mutual and self-respect. Um, so let's have a, a closer look at mutual and self-respect and see how they relate to emotional intelligence, because that's absolutely key if you can have any self-respect. So self-respect, for me, the ability to look yourself in the eye, in the mirror and be content with what you see. OK, so after you've uh, led a mission in theatre, after you've led on the rugby pitch, can you look yourself in the eye, in the mirror and say, yeah, I did my best. You know, I, I did my best and I was, a, I was a good leader there. To do that, you've got to have a fair degree of self-awareness. Um, I think you can't really have self-respect unless you're self-aware. Because like the little kitten, you might look in the mirror and what you see um, beaming back at you is someone who was amazing on the rugby pitch today, didn't do anything wrong, flawless, led by example. That might not be the case. So it's very important to try and develop those self-awareness skills. So when we're flying with you, when you're doing command tasks, this is why we get you to try and lead things off with your analysis of your performance. It's a very, very useful skill for you to develop that self-awareness. And when you get it right, and um, you're, you're clued in and your emotional intelligence gets to a level that you're very self-aware, that's when you can look yourself in the eye in the mirror and say, yeah, that's me. That was a good, a good day today. That was a good, a good shift of work. Uh, and you, you build that self-respect. You've earned your own uh, respect. Um, moving on from that, mutual respect. So if we're going to put all that effort into generating that self-awareness um, to, to build and work at that self-respect, 
we can't go to all that work and then not give people the good grace of respecting them. Seems really obvious, um, but unfortunately this is often the case, that we can get so wrapped around ourselves that we sometimes forget to pay simple, um, simple elements of respect to our peers. And it can be really small things as well, you know, having the respect to remember to ask how a family member is if, then, if you know they're not well. It can be really small things that make the difference. But if we're going to focus on self-awareness, we need to also build that mutual respect with our peers uh, and use similar sorts of skills with them. Now, unfortunately, your generation is going to have to battle the narcissist label. Um, I've been reading a lot of books about this. I'm trying to sort of come to terms with what I'm reading. There's always intergenerational access to grind. Um, you know, the greatest generation had it against um, Gen X. Uh, sorry, against the baby boomers. The baby boomers had it against Gen X. Gen X have it against I. That we sometimes forget to pay simple, um, simple elements of respect to our peers and it can be really small things as well you know having the respect to remember to ask how a family member is if then if you know they're not well it can be really small things that make the difference but if we're going to focus on self-awareness we need to also build that mutual respect with our peers uh, and use similar sorts of skills with them now unfortunately your generation is going to have to battle the narcissist label um, I've been reading a lot of books about this. I'm trying to sort of come to terms with what I'm reading. There's always intergenerational access to grind. Um, you know, the greatest generation had it against um, Gen X. Uh, sorry, against the baby boomers. The baby boomers had it against Gen X. Gen X have it against iGen. Um, there's some very interesting books about this that I'll talk about later. Um, you guys have been labelled as quite a narcissistic generation. So you've got to combat that. To combat that, use your emotional intelligence. Use your self-awareness skills, earn your own self-respect and then apply that to other people. Be respectful of other people that you are leading. Or if you're in a team and you're following someone, be respectful of that leader. Use these skills and prove people wrong. Or maybe you don't want to prove them wrong. There's an interesting argument that I'll get to later about narcissists are just better leaders. That's why so many leaders are narcissists. So maybe you actually you want to play to that stereotype for your generation. I don't know, but it's a good discussion. A tool that we're going to give you to help you is on the leadership camp. Sergeant Brister is going to teach you how to practice uh, 360 degree feedback. So when you finish a command task, uh, a stretch or run, whatever it is, you're going to kick off with that good self-awareness and say how you think it went. Uh, then your peers are going to tell you what they think. Uh, honestly, it's another skill that takes moral courage. Not going to be easy. If they've done badly, you owe your peer the respect to tell them frankly. Um, you don't need to be a dick about it, but owe them that respect that you tell them frankly how they did. Don't just blow sunshine because you're not helping them. We're all here to learn skills that will help you in the future. Um, then finally, the DS who've sat uh, over it all will put their input in. So that way we've got a full rounded picture of what happened. Maybe that will help us. Uh, it's a practical skill that will help you develop self-awareness um, and also you can learn from the experiences of others as we go. Not an easy skill to get right, um, but that cumulative picture of what's happened will help you in the long run. And that we'll practice when we get back together for a leadership camp. Enough on respect. Remember, no cat pictures, cat posters. Integrity then. Integrity, I'll try not to go on for too long, uh, but integrity is a real big one here. There were many reasons I joined the Air Force, but I think... Uh, the values that I saw and integrity being a key one as a rugby player is what attracted me to the Air Force. No good examples of leadership on the rugby pitch did I see that didn't contain integrity. All the best leaders on the park had it. Um, I hope I did when I was captain, but I don't know. Um, and that's one of the things that drew me to the Air Force. So fascinating subject. AP1 um, describes it as um, moral courage. Honesty, responsibility and justice all combined. Um, a lot of the authors I've been reading recently talk about integrity as well. So rugby, obviously, I've been re I read uh, Clive Woodward's book, How to Win, uh, after the, the latest Rugby World Cup. Clive Woodward was the coach of England when they won in 2003. He obviously has a lot to say about integrity, uh, especially when you come down to responsibility and justice. He talks about <clears throat> how the England rugby team in 2003 had a little black book. 
uh, full of what he called teamship rules. He doesn't believe in leadership or followership as we would describe it. He uh, believes in teamship. It's all about the team working together to, to achieve great things, less about the leader, more about the team, which is fine at the elite level. Um, you can do that, I think. It's a bit different at the sort of leadership you're going to have to do in the future uh, in the military field or elsewhere. You might have to deal with very junior, inexperienced people who you can't empower that much yet. But at the elite level, his idea of teamship is quite good. And these teamship rules were written down uh, between himself, the whole team, and Martin Johnson agreed at the start of the season a bunch of rules, a bunch of behaviours um, that they were held responsible for. Um, and they agreed them at the start of the season. Little things like uh, who takes responsibility for who's a defensive captain, who has responsibility for making sure the kit is all tidy put away, um, clean the locker rooms. Everyone's heard about Richie McCaw and the All Blacks uh, sweeping their, their changing room. A lot of the rugby coaches didn't like that because that was seen as a, a marketing ploy to sell the book Legacy and a uh, Amazon documentary they did. All rugby players do that. They clean up after themselves at the highest level. That's not a new thing. That's not an all black thing. Very interesting book. Uh, obviously talks about integrity a lot. Brené Brown. So Brené Brown, uh, the ultimate Texas soccer mom. Um, I'm being facetious. She is does a lot of TED Talks. Great one on vulnerability. She's an entrepreneur. She's a visionary and she's a very, very respected leadership theorist. She talks an awful lot about integrity and values. She thinks values are integral to any sort of leadership. She's a very value-based form of leadership. A difficult read, what we in the military might describe as fluffy. Uh, she's not military in any way, shape or form, which can make the way she talks difficult, especially when she talks about things like vulnerability, which is a big obsession of hers, the ability and courage to make yourself vulnerable to be a good leader, because we in the military can see that as weakness. It's not weakness, um, and there's a, a great deal to learn from this book, uh, and I thank Fyfer and Adcock for recommending it to me. Um, it's not our language, but good God, there's some great lessons in there about um, having the courage to Take the responsibility of leadership, the integrity to actually live to your values, not just profess them on a cat poster, to actually make them your behaviours that people can see and respect uh, for that. Um, a great book with some great examples and actually a lot of um, anecdotes from military leaders as well. Uh, Stanley McChrystal, the original snake eater, four star special forces general, uh, fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, his book on leaders takes on Plutarch's lives, which I've mentioned previously, comparing and contrasting different leaders from uh, history, not just military history, uh, different leaders like Marriott Tubman, uh, Harriet Tubman, sorry, and things like that. Uh, in terms of integrity, he uses a couple of interesting examples. He talks about al Zakawi, who was an Islamic fundamentalist leader for uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who he fought uh, as the head of Task Force Black with our very own SAS and SBS. He uses him as an example of integrity because in the eyes of his followers, al Sakawi had to be that uh, archetypal, um, devout, religious leader. Uh, he needed that religious integrity to be able to, to lead his, uh, his fight against the coalition. Um, so a very interesting exploration there. Um, we'll talk in more detail uh, about McChrystal in a second, because I just want to pull some quotes up that they talk about. So from Brené Brown, uh, Brené Brown, sorry, spelling mistake. Integrity is choosing courage over comfort. It's choosing what's right over what's fun, fast or easy. And it's practicing your values, not just professing them. She talks about the difference between behaviours and bullshit. She says that you can profess values. Uh, and there's, I've gone through an exercise with you all recently where you highlighted two values. Uh, for me, it was uh, courage and trying to make a difference. But that means nothing if they don't affect your behaviours. What behaviours do you do as an individual day to day in the workplace during your command tasks that actually makes your values a reality? That's what she cares about. Behaviours, not bullshit. And also there's that accusation, doing what's right over what's fun, fast and easy. A challenge you guys are going to face in your generation that you need to be resilient to and argue back. Um, I, Jen, you're going to get labelled with that. More of that to come. Woodward then. Teamship, the combination of leadership and followership. Teamship is not about values, but a list of actions or behaviours. We must move beyond tired cliches about leadership. You see, Woodward hates cat posters too. And finally then, Stanley McChrystal, uh, the warrior prophet that he is, along with Mad Dog, uh, General Mattis. Uh, the Americans have a, 
a habit of churning these guys out, incredibly well-read, experienced people. Anyway, I digress. Those who emerge as successful leaders are not necessarily those with the best values. A lot of values-based leadership theory is out there. It's very popular. We read it and we think, yes, yes, be vulnerable, show courage. This is the sort of leadership. I want to be authentic. Servant leadership, yes. But when we look out in the world, a lot of our leaders are narcissists. And there's been studies that prove that the majority of leaders are narcissists and don't lead the values they espouse. They mostly spout bullshit or they don't even lead from a value sense base. So should we be trying to lead that way? Um, maybe you shouldn't deflect the claim of being a narcissist. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe that'll make you a better leader. All things that are open for discussion. End of part one. Okay, back with you for part two of this video then. Uh, let's get straight on and look at service. AP1 uh, defines service as containing physical courage, loyalty, commitment and teamwork. Uh, all of these things, really big hitting core values that uh, contribute hugely to leadership, uh, but also one of the, some of the first things that attracted me to actually joining the Air Force when I was your age. Uh, physical courage, a hard one to talk about um, because you won't really know how you're going to react, especially in a leadership role, until you're exposed to physical courage. You won't really know. Uh, hopefully the training just kicks in at that point, but until you're in that moment, um, you can't really know how you'll react. You can just hope for the best. Uh, but training will get you there, the training you do with us. You can practice though as well. Sergeant Brister is going to be very keen to get you out on the slopes, get you on the high ropes, get you out mountain biking, rock climbing. And all of this is just trying to push you, push that boundary of your physical courage and get you to that place where you are scared. Um, be like Niall, throw yourself out of a fully serviceable aircraft. Um, you know, George hurtling down hills on mountain bikes. All of these things are good things for developing that physical courage, pushing yourself to the limit that you start to get scared, smiling and carrying on as you're doing. Uh, and we'll explore those in training with you and hopefully leave you well prepared uh, for the physical courage that is without doubt required um, in a uniform service when you're on operations is one of our, our key things, I suppose. Um, but loyalty, commitment and teamwork, these we can talk about at more at greater length because these are the things that uh, directly contribute to good leadership within the military. Um, as I've already discussed, the elements of integrity uh, combined with these elements of service, this is what makes military leadership training such an attractive thing to have on your CV, I would argue, uh, and something that you guys can use if you don't come uh, and join us later in your career. Um, loyalty, commitment, teamwork, all of these things, when understood and employed, will make you a better leader and a better part of a team. Um, and also, that's one of the nice things about the uniform service is why uh, RAF, Army, Navy can work pretty seamlessly together because we have these core values that we know are the same and we know what we can expect from each other in terms of commitment and teamwork and things like this. Also the case when you go on operations and you're working with the Americans, the Australians, the Swedes, uniform military services nearly always have these elements of service as a high ideal quite rightly, uh, and you know you can trust that in them. So it's a useful thing to have on your CV. Partially why that is a useful thing to have on your CV is that when you accept and actively go about engaging in these core values in your day-to-day -day work, it makes you more resilient to change and uncertainty, uh, which is something we're gonna look at uh, a bit later on. And it's definitely something that you want on your CV in modern times. Servant leadership then, uh, we talked about in leadership theory, and there are elements of um, the value of service, which I think do directly link to servant leadership. You know, if you, servant leadership, that idea that to be the best sort of boss, best sort of leadership model, it's not about your promotion and what you want, it's about getting the best for your team, empowering them and developing them. And I've seen lots of evidence of that in my time in the Air Force, and it, and it does exist. However, there are difficulties, because if you look at the diagram, um, it's saying that a safe environment, and they do talk about that psychological safety that Google identified in Project Aristotle being essential for, for good teamwork, good leadership. 
Now, in the military, we obviously can't guarantee that that safe environment will be there because that's part of our raison d'etre to operate where physical courage is required because it is dangerous. However, what you can do by providing loyalty, commitment, teamwork, and really fostering an environment that promotes these values, you can ensure that even in a physically dangerous environment that a person feels psychologically safe because they are part of a tight knit team and that camaraderie that it builds really is uh, what it is to be in the military uh, for me. Um, you, you touch on it with contact sports like rugby, uh, but you never quite get there. Uh, and the military will show you that, that when exposed to danger, when you embrace values such as loyalty, commitment and teamwork, you can go to places that uh, other careers and other sorts of leadership can't get to. So there are some useful parallels. The other thing that, that uh, service life will struggle with with servant leadership is it's not all about empowering your people. That's important. Biggest thing for us, achieving that mission. That's why they talk about action-centered leadership at Cranwell because even though uh, we value teamwork uh, and loyalty to your men incredibly highly, the mission is what will always come first. Let's bounce back. Uh, to that resilience point because a lot of the books I've been reading kind of uh, bounce around this issue and it's very very relevant for your generation so I think resilience is inherently linked to the value of service because I think if you embrace some of these values it makes you more resilient which is just a good thing so if you have a quick look then um, less on physical courage but, courage, but we are going to look at loyalty commitment and teamwork and how this uh, increases resilience now, one of the books that I've been reading recently is called The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, two uh, professors in America wrote this book. Um, it must be a, about um, five years ago now. It caused a bit of a stir. It was originally an article in The Atlantic. And they proposed that there was a unique situation going on um, with the culture that they were seeing at American colleges. And they were seeing a distinct lack of resilience um, in students at the colleges and that they thought they were adhering to three myths, um, that whatever doesn't kill you makes you weaker, um, that if you feel something, it's true. Um, and the third one is that the world is populated by good and evil people. And they felt that by adhering to these myths or the fact that they've been brought up to adhere to them uh, meant that they couldn't cope in situations they were faced with in the educational environment, which involved that kind of um, to and fro of uh, conversation and argument and good debate that we all know and that they fe felt that the college students were seeking safe spaces there was all of that no platforming going on because they could not cope with they, they were beginning to believe that words were violence and that they weren't safe um, so they look extensively at this it's a very interesting book very much centered on America but they do think there are elements of it in the UK which is why I'm desperate to have a debate on this issue with you guys at some point because I want to know if this is true, if these things exist, if you've seen uh, evidence of no platforming. But the reason I mention these books, you guys are going to be accused, rightly or wrongly, of being a less resilient generation. So understand your enemy, read these books and then debunk it. Because lots of people do debunk, debunk them. There's a great online uh, debate with Malcolm Gladwell where he goes at these, uh, these two and another lady because he thinks that some of their arguments are wrong and misplaced. Um, so it's not a given. Uh, so The Madness of Crowds is another one I read recently by Douglas Murray. Not an academic, a journalist. Um, he brings this similar debate back to UK shores and he's talking about culture wars and identity politics and how he thinks there's a culture of victimhood that uh, young people are using, especially in universities, as a way to gain power over people by luxuriating in that victimhood. And he thinks it's fraudulent and dangerous. Uh, now, a lot of people have criticised this book because he's a journalist and he's definitely gone out with, a, with an argument in mind. Um, however, if you take this with a pinch of salt, it is ultimately a brave book because he's taking a pop at social justice warriors um, and calling them out on some things. Um, and it's very, it's a very dangerous thing to do in, in, in today's uh, age. But, you know, you should be able to debate these things rightly or wrongly. Uh, so an interesting book. And he also highlights a lack of resilience um, in your generation in Gen Z. iGen is a book uh, by a very well regarded academic called Twenge. Uh, she looked at uh, the generation board from 1995 onwards. And she was looking at whether the intimate relationship with social media via a smartphone had uniquely changed the way that that generation were raised. And she believes that it 
did. She uh, she tries to be even handed. And she tries to say, look, there are some incredible benefits that this generation bring. I gen, as she calls your generation, uh, that I gen are incredibly tolerant. They are not prejudiced at all. They're healthier. They're very, very sharp and capable uh, in many respects academically because they're much more driven. They've been told to be, um, you know, it's much harder to get the grades you need now to go to Oxford and uh, Cambridge is far more than in my day, for example. But she does also highlight, once again, that lack of resilience um, for her, it is the inability to confront arguments that do not agree uh, with your own, developing a certain narcissism um, that makes you, uh, a term that often comes up is anti-fragile, or I'm sorry, too fragile, and the, the aim is to be anti-fragile, um, as Nassim Taleb would say, uh, and be able to deal with arguments that don't meet your viewpoint. Uh, a very, very interesting book uh, and very well researched. Before all of this discussion, and as, as the army recruitment ad behind me shows you, we still want to recruit your generation, uh, rightly or wrongly. And, and to be fair, rightly, because like uh, Twenge says, there are a lot of incredibly positive traits from your generation, which you need to focus on in your CVs as well. But just be aware these negative views are out there. And for me, the whole discussion about raising increasing rates of anxiety and depression in your generation is incredibly valid. Uh, I think it is something that we need to address, something we need to talk about. And this guy, uh, Blind Boy Boatface, he's on BBC, he's on um, the iPlayer, on uh, Blind Boy Undestroys on BBC Three. Very, very funny Irish comedian, but he is a big advocate of um, mental health awareness. Very funny, but he talks about a lot of these issues as well and confronts them head on. Uh, I would highly recommend him and his podcast, which you'll find on Spotify as well. So resilience something you need to explore as a topic because people are going to accuse you of not having it. So service then, probably with integrity, the key sort of uh, core values that contribute to good leadership by employing uh, loyalty, commitment and teamwork is just going to make you a better leader if you can practically show those behaviours in the leadership environment and it will develop resilience, which is all good for your CV. OK, so the last one then. Excellence. So uh, AP1 describes excellence as the, the pursuit of personal excellence, discipline and pride. Discipline, I'm not going to talk to you about that Sergeant Brister's bag and you've all got a good handle on that. Pride, we've already talked about this a little bit with self-respect, self-awareness. You know, uh, what are you entitled to feel proud of? Now, the proudest day of my life was when I uh, pinned my wings on at the end of, uh, so I had my wings pinned on at the end of Linton um, and finished basic fast jet training because I knew that was as far as I was going to go because it was really, really hard. Um, and that's why I'm most proud of it. And it was as far as I went. Um, but don't kid yourself. If you want to be like this guy and you want to fly fast jets and be a fighter pilot, it is really hard and you have to be excellent in a lot of ways. But that is a good thing. Chase it down. Chase down excellence. Don't be happy and argue that mediocrity is OK. Chase down excellence in a passionate way and we will help you to do that. So sometimes if you think we're being overcritical at the end of your flying sorties, I do. I Well, no, I don't apologise because we want that for you. We want you to pursue that excellence and not be willing to accept the fact uh, that you were below average. And if that was because you didn't do enough work on the ground, be self-aware enough to identify it and sort that out for next time in the pursuit of excellence. Um, and then you can quite rightly feel proud about what you achieve. But you've got to be careful as that self-awareness piece between pride and narcissism to make sure you're not drifting over into that. A really good example is the quote I'm going to read to you now about how not to be proudful, uh, too proudful is that a word, not, not to be too proud of what you've achieved. So this quote was written um, by a man who is a very experienced four-star military general, seen it all, done it all, written about it, um, special forces soldier. And this is what he writes about leadership. By most measures, I was a competent leader. Still, leading remained difficult and it has never gotten any easier. It helps somewhat to read history, to emulate successful role models and to listen to the counsel of others. But the wisdom they provided and the solutions they offered never completely fit. In the end, I came to an accommodation. I will never master leadership and yet I will never cease the effort to do so. Faced with uncertainty and change, I will seek to adapt where I can and endure where I can't. I like the humility in that statement. Um, and as you might have guessed, uh, this statement um, was not Brad Pitt. War Machine is a depiction of General McChrystal's life. 
But uh, this is a direct quote from McChrystal's book, The Myths of Leadership. After all of his years, all of his studies, all of his experience, he still knows that it's an ever-shifting target. You can never really get a handle on what leadership is. But the very fact that you try, the very fact that you're researching these things, you want to get better, you aspire to be a better leader, you take what works, you ditch what doesn't work, that pursuit will make you a better leader. And that's what we want to get to. We are not going to make you perfect leaders. IoT isn't. 